is uh, a, uh, a pleasure to do, I think this may be our 13th or 14th session of Wires University. So um, uh, if, um, if people aren't quite getting the whole transmission thing, at this, it's, it's not our fault. But um, <laughs> we, uh, we're delighted uh, that you're here. Uh, obviously, the word of the day is infrastructure. And uh, interestingly enough, if you look through the president's proposals and, uh, and a lot of things in the uh, recent funding uh, legislation, you'll find not a great deal about electric transmission. We think it's a critical, uh, critical network uh, that uh, not enough attention is being paid to. Uh, you've heard a lot, and, and uh, uh, the commentators are all over the fact that uh, American infrastructure is rated a D-plus by the American Society of Civil Engineers. Uh, well, among those uh, qualifying for a D-plus is electric transmission. Despite the fact that we've invested um, uh, 80 or 90 billion dollars in the last decade primarily to make up for underinvestment in the grid since the uh, late 70s. Uh, so we're, we're, uh, we're getting back in the saddle in terms of investing in the grid, but we, uh, there's something happening that's probably pretty obvious to all of us. Uh, society's becoming more animated by electric power. Uh, not just iPhones, uh, but electric heating. And there is a large transportation fleet out there that before too long is going to be electric powered. Is the grid ready for that? Um, I submit that it probably isn't. And if you're depending on uh, uh, low cost renewable energy that comes from uh, very remote locations very often uh, in the middle of the country, um, uh, you are going to need a more uh, robust transmission grid. It's the only way you can move that power in any great quantities to markets. So uh, we are here uh, to talk today about uh, a couple of very important uh, topics. Uh, it's... Um, it's uh, 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 clear to those of us in the business that uh, the grid is not as robust as it needs to be to meet the demands, the coming demands uh, of the electrified economy. Um, so how do we persuade uh, um, uh, policymakers, regulators, the public, that this is uh, a place where we can uh, invest with very, very positive results in the long run. Remember, these are assets. Once you build them, put them in the ground, they're going to be there for a half century. And they're going to be serving uh, not just uh, your children, but your grandchildren and beyond, probably. Uh, today, we are, uh, we are still leaning on uh, transmission that was built in the 19... Uh, 50s, 60s, uh, and 70s. So uh, planning ahead is not something that, uh, that we've done a whole lot of in this country, and I'm personally delighted that the president has put a uh, shining light on infrastructure and the need to plan ahead and invest. Um, uh, we can talk more about that later, but this morning, uh, we bring you, the Wires Group, brings you uh, two experts in the area. Uh, Julia Freyer is, uh, is a uh, director, I think is that, or managing director at London Economics International. She's uh, out of the Boston area and has done two or three studies for the Wires organization. Um, uh, we're going to talk about two of those today one that deals with the myths associated with transmission. Uh, a lot of people think we can't invest or shouldn't invest in that area for a variety of reasons. 
I think you'll be very interested in what she has to say about those uh, misconceptions. Um, uh, uh, she's here with her, with her colleague, Eva Wang, and uh, together they and other colleagues at, at London Economics come up with a, uh, uh, the study of MIS and a second study. Uh, uh, this is the uh, How Does Electric Transmission Benefit You? Uh, and this is the short version. She also has uh, a methodological treatise that goes with this if you're really, if you're really uh, into this stuff. And, and uh, uh, it, it, it does something that I think is fairly rare, and that is she's looked at transmission, these long-term, uh, long-lived assets, uh, and, uh, and, and calculated, projected, what the benefits will be over the life of those assets. And, and uh, she'll talk about what those benefits are. There are lots of different ones that change over time, but, um, but the benefits are real. Problem is, uh, planners don't typically focus on anything beyond electric reliability. So uh, that'll be interesting. Uh, so we're gonna take, uh, I think, the uh, first study the MIST study, then, then the benefits study. Uh, with, uh, with Julia this morning is, uh, is my friend and, uh, and my new boss, because she's president of WIRES this year, uh, uh, Nina Plauschen. She is a uh, vice president, uh, the title is a long one, vice president of uh, regulatory federal affairs and communications. Um, uh, and uh, at in ITC Holdings, uh, and she'll tell you a little bit about that company. But uh, it was my pleasure when I was on the FERC to begin to work in, on independent transmission companies and uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, the transmission only companies that emerged in Michigan. I had the pleasure of of working on uh, and that they became part of ITC Holdings. Uh, Nina is uh, uh, one of, I, I guess what I would call one of the big brains in the business and, and uh, I think she and Julia are gonna kind of toss things back and forth about these studies, about the myths, about the benefits of transmission. And we invite you to uh, think about some good, very tough questions about uh, about the the benefits, the challenges that uh, transmission developers face uh, in this changing uh, environment, changing not just politically, but changing uh, in terms of the economy, in terms of technology, uh, and um, uh, and transmission is going to play a very major role in in all those all those changes. So. Uh, uh, do you want to add anything to, to, to that? Do you want to say a little something about ITC? Uh, yeah, I can do that. Uh, ITC is obviously, as uh, Jim mentioned, an independent transmission company. That means we own no generation and we own no distribution. Uh, we are headquartered in Michigan, but we also have assets in Iowa, in Kansas, Minnesota, a small part of Illinois, uh, and Oklahoma. Uh, we are part of a larger organization. We are one of a Fortis company, which is a Canadian-based company that also owns uh, generation and transmission assets in New York and in Arizona. Um, Jim has sort of outed me a little bit, and I think this is probably the story for wires. Um, you know, ITC and, and wires go back a long way, and we were talking about transmission when transmission wasn't cool. Um, and, you know, there was a time when we were at facing three decades of underinvestment in the grid and there was a strong need for more transmission. Um, and so the independent transmission model sort of came out of that, wires came, came out of that. Um, and now we've gone through something of a build cycle and it's interesting because now that we're through that build cycle, I think one of the myths we're gonna talk about is so what does that mean for the grid? You know, we've had a big investment spur over the last 10 years, what happens now? Um, and I think that it'll be very interesting to talk about how 
the environment that the grid is operating in has changed too because it's not a stagnant equation. When we first started talking about investment in transmission, we were talking about vertically integrated utilities who were servicing their load and basically generation relatively close to where it was being used. We have a totally new environment, which is much different. Um, so I would just say that um, I'm very pleased to be here. I uh, am glad that some of you still care about transmission. Um, I know there's a lot of other issues competing for interest these days, but I guess I would just preface this by saying, you know, one of the reasons WIRE exists is because we want to educate people on the issues. We are here to make sure people actually understand some pretty complex matters. But we're also here because, you know, when we talk about infrastructure, when we talk about growth of the economy, a big piece of that is the cost of power. And a, and a part of that solution and keeping power prices low is transmission. You can't get away from that. Um, and so with that, I guess I'll turn it over to Julie. Great. Uh, and uh, good morning to everyone. Thank you, Jim, for the introduction and Nina. Um, and thank you, WIRES and the Environmental and Energy Study Institute for for hosting us here today. Um, and last but not least, thank you to my colleagues who've uh, worked with me for the past year. I think we started about a year ago on the two studies that I'm going to talk about today. Um, generally speaking, transmission investment is a very important issue to me because I'm engaged. I, I work as a consultant in the electricity sector, and transmission is what really connects and completes what we call our power system. Um, you can't um, um, deliver electricity without the transmission. Um, but I think transmission investment should actually be important to all of us, not just those that work in the sector directly, because of the cost of electricity. The fact is we're all consumers, um, and we all um, are impacted by decisions made um, with respect to transmission investment. Um, so with that introduction, I think the first goal today is to provide some basic facts about um, transmission investment and in so doing hopefully dispel some of what I call the myths uh, that we've heard um, about the need or the lack thereof uh, for investment. The second paper uh, which will um, we'll take some questions after the first uh, first few slides. The second paper is then to really accomplish our second goal of the day and I hope um, I can at least um, provide a, a basic explanation of how transmission investment can benefit um, everyone here in the room, consumers, households, owners of businesses, and generally the, the economy uh, here in the U.S. So um, I know I've set two very large goals for myself, but I'm hoping that uh, um, I get some good marks uh, uh, after the day is done. So uh, as Jim said, we have two papers out there. There's copies in the front for those who'd like to take a copy back home with them. Uh, they're also available electronically off the WIRES website. Um, and there's fact sheets on your chairs, if you haven't found them already, that provide the website link. Um, uh, I won't spend much time uh, around um, talking about the myths, because we're going to step into it, and I want it to be a little bit of a, of a surprise. But really, the purpose was to, I think, debunk what I personally hear quite often when I go see regulators, policymakers, um, decision makers, investors, um, uh, private equity firms, banks, about wh why, are you, why are you here supporting this. We don't need new transmission. They just had a billion dollars last year. They made a bunch of investments. We're good for now. And I think um, we want to take apart that statement and make sure we understand why people think that way and then correct their thinking. The second paper, as Jim suggested, um, is a little bit more of a next step. So once we correct people's thinking, um, or make sure we understand um, what the true needs of transmission are. How do we get um, transmission investment evaluated and approved? And one of the um, uh, missing links, in my opinion, is the fact that we sometimes have a hard time understanding how transmission benefits us. It's large infrastructure. We understand the cost because engineers are all over that. They have a good handle on how much it takes to put up new transmission towers and, and conduct a new line and so forth. But benefits tend to be more of an enigma to many of us, um, and in part because I don't think um, historically transmission planners, system planners were required to 
establish the economic value proposition or the benefits of investment. But I think in this day and age, um, it's really important to bring that all down. And I'm hoping that with a second study, I can help explain some of the benefits over time and we can examine them together in terms of dollars and cents because I think the more conventional rubric used in the transmission planning world of um, uh, loss of load expectations, second contingencies, N minus one, minus one events, that sounds like super science to many of us and it's, it's very hard to explain it. Um, I always try to use my 11 year old as my test case he does not know what n minus 1 minus 1 is, but he knows a billion dollars. It's a lot of benefit. So hopefully we can, uh, we can get there today. Um, so on with the myths. Um, and I apologize, I talk fast. Uh, but I'm happy to also take questions, so don't hesitate uh, to wait till the end. Um, I might uh, uh, talk past the point, so feel free to, um, to stop me at any point in time. So we've identified 16 common myths in our first paper. Um, and all the myths basically revolve around the basic question of why we don't need transmission or why we don't need more transmission. Um, and we've categorized those 16 myths into five broad categories so that we're covering all aspects of the arguments we've heard. There's arguments about demand side. There's arguments about we don't need transmission because other supply side um, considerations will um, meet the needs of electricity consumers. There's arguments about other new technologies, alternatives to transmission. There's also arguments about the cost. And finally, I think also um, about the uh, uh, certainty of the benefits that transmission provides. Um, I'd like to take you through a few examples today. We won't have time to go through 16 myths, but um, I'd like to at least cover a few um, and try to explain um, uh, why I think those myths arise. Um, in my mind, legends, myths, they all have some factual foundation. There's a seed of truth there. The problem really happens when that seed of truth uh, gets overwhelmed um, with, um, in many cases, um, misunderstandings of uh, the value of transmission. The fact is that um, uh, we're not just building for today. We're building for today, tomorrow, the day after, and for the longer term. And um, uh, that uh, type of perspective is sometimes um, lost in the context of what we are more certain about, which is really about today and tomorrow. Um, so let me, without much embellishment, unless Nina wants to jump in, I'll start with the first example we came up with. Um, and maybe Nina has some first-hand experience to comment after I describe it a bit. Um, so I often hear uh, people talk about the fact that demand is forecast to not increase demand for electricity and maybe even decline. Um, if you're familiar with uh, perhaps your own utility or your local RTO or system operator, they put out demand forecasts for electricity. and. Across many parts of the U.S., demand growth has really come down um, uh, into low single digits. Uh, Twenty years ago when I started in the industry, we were having demand growth projections that are 2 to 3 percent per year in line with um, 2 to 3 percent per year GDP, gro GDP growth estimates at the time. Um, and now they've come down um, quite a bit. So there is a seed of truth in that I recognize that our Near-term demand forecasts are fairly stable. They have plateaued, so we're not seeing electric growth. But that doesn't mean that we won't see the need for transmission. And the issue is that transmission, as Jim pointed out, is an investment that has a very long-term planning horizon. Not only does it take a long time to develop and construct, but more importantly, it will provide value, provide benefits for a very long time frame. Usually we talk about 50 plus years, maybe even uh, into the 80 plus years horizon. So when we talk about do we have demand that necessitates transmission investment, we should really be talking or asking ourselves the question of will we have demand over the next 50 years that will um, need new transmission investment. And there's a multitude of forecasts out there that suggest that is definitely the case despite what the near term um, 
prognosis is for electricity demand, we are expecting a major electrification of our economies. Electrification in the transportation sector won't happen in the next year or the next five years, maybe not even in the next 10 years in the levels to really make an impact, but in the next 30 to 50 years, uh, we're expecting, as that graphic suggests, um, a significant push um, uh, in the transportation sector. It's the gray bar. Um, and I think uh, by the 2050 horizon, we're expecting that it's responsible for um, two terawatt hour, 2,000 terawatt hours of additional load um, across the U.S. But another element is also electrification of the um, uh, excuse me, of the heating sector. That too is expected, and that's the red bar to um, increase significantly uh, over time. Um, we're also expecting, in addition to just growth in new activities um, or load patterns, just even a transition to where people put their businesses and where electricity is needed. Two examples um, are discussed in the paper, and that relates to um, uh, the new information technology sector and the fact that we need a lot of electricity to support servers. <laughs> and. Yeah. Server farms are coming up in very strange places that weren't anticipated. And also we're seeing a boom in our um, domestic uh, natural gas production, and that also requires a lot of electricity. Nina, do you want to jump I, in? I'm, I'm the color commentary for this program. So um, I would say, you know, one thing that just is an interesting story from an ITC perspective is, of course, this issue where, you know, we have seen greater efficiency, so we've seen some drop in demand. Um, but we've also seen a switch, you know, away from some traditional manufacturing jobs. But what is now coming up are the Amazons, the big data centers. And they're not necessarily locating in places where we would traditionally have a large amount of transmission or generation. We have a very large data center going in in Iowa, for example. Well, Iowa is a pretty rural area by and large. Um, we have a lot of transmission there, but it's lower voltage because people are farther apart. Um, and so when you say, I'm going to put a huge amount of load in Iowa now for a data center, that's great for the state, good tax base, maybe some jobs. But it also means, oh no, I have to hurry up and build a bunch of stuff to serve these, this need. Um, and so, and you know, probably have seen on the news that Amazon's got like three or four locations where they might put their next big uh, facility, their big warehouse. So there are very large customers who are coming into play now that we haven't seen in the past. And we also represent, you know, we have transmission in the Detroit area. Well, Detroit obviously has gone through a huge economic downturn. But what's happening now? Well, businesses are starting to come back. We are getting more uh, businesses and manufacturing even in the state. And so, you know, one of the things we're going to talk about later, but to keep in mind, when we talk about a long planning horizon, you know, generally we plan for at least 10 years, but we need to really be looking even farther out frequently to figure out what, what's going to happen um, is, OK, well, we know some of these things are coming. We're trying to address them, but at the same time, um, you know, does that match up with how we look at planning and, and how we actually do these things? And so um, you have to be ready to accept the fact that the future is uncertain and you have to look at multiple scenarios because none of us know exactly what 20 years from now is going to look like. And so what you don't want to have is a situation where someone wants to locate in the upper peninsula of Michigan, just as an example. We don't have the facilities up there to accommodate them, so we tell them, that's great. In seven years, you can put your business there. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not good for the state of Michigan. That's not good for the customer. That's not good for anybody. But that's how long it sometimes takes to build these facilities. And so when we talk about you know, new demand, you need to think of it, too, as, well, how ready are we for this potential influx? Not just, well, we can build it once we need it, because that could be a very long lag. Um, another argument that I've um, um, commonly heard from decision makers is that transmission isn't really needed anymore because of new technologies, um, uh, kind of new ideas that appear to be less costly, smaller scale, so um, uh, they don't require as much of a commitment from regulators and decision makers. But I think um, that story is actually something that we've spent quite a, a, a long time trying to um, unravel. That story is 
a misconception about how the actual power system works. The power system doesn't work because we can replace transmission with um, uh, energy efficiency and demand side management, um, and it, it won't work if we replace all transmission with new conventional generation, and that's just two examples. Really the power system is, a, is a, a portfolio, a combination of many different technologies. We need the transmission just as much as we need the generation and the energy efficiency programs and um, uh, demand response and distributed generation and, and, and frankly, um, uh, new technologies down the road. Um, more importantly, too, um, the need for various pieces of the system have their kind of unique fit. Um, one of our prior studies from a few years back, we evaluated the services that transmission can provide relative to the services of other uh, alternatives. We call them market resource alternatives, but I'm sure some of you have also heard of them referred to as non-transmission alternatives, but essentially uh, looking at other pieces of the grid, like um, in this particular chart, uh, we've got energy efficiency as a column, demand response as a column, distributed generation, and energy storage. And this is just an excerpt. We have a, actually a larger chart that contains many other technologies of, uh, across the landscape of the um, electricity um, uh, sector. Uh, and what you can see from these moon charts is transmission really from the ability to uh, deliver a variety of products over uh, large geographical areas for long durations um, tends to kind of win out um, in terms of um, uh, its ability to provide those. That's the black colored moon charts. Um, other technologies, alternatives can do the same in certain segments um, in certain characteristics, but not across the board, um, uh, and, and not in the same way that transmission can. I have to comment on this issue because I'm absolutely certain all of you have heard about this, which is, of course, solar panels, people putting solar panels on their homes. There is sort of this um, mythology out there now that, you know, all utilities hate solar panels and there's some big conflict. You know. From a transmission company point of view, and I think also from a wires point of view, no one is trying to prevent people from making choices in terms of customer choices, in terms of what makes sense for them. There are some issues around cost, around who's paying and who's benefiting. There are issues around economies of scale. But putting all of that aside, you know, when we go to interconnect a customer, if it's a bunch of aggregated solar panels, it looks the same to me as any other type of demand response or any other type of generation. Um, but what's interesting about it is um, the value proposition for solar panels. There's a value for you as an individual customer because you can use it and you know presumably be off the grid. Um, but the real value proposition comes in selling back into the grid, aggregating all the, the energy that's not being used at any given time in these facilities, in these homes, wherever they may be, and then selling them back. And we're seeing that in New York, we're seeing that in California, we're seeing it anywhere where there's large penetration of um, solar panels or other types of distributed resources. What we also see are those aggregators pairing that type of resource with storage. And the reason they're doing that is because it has to be deliverable. It has to be what we call firm in the business. Nobody wants to buy anything that you may not be able to deliver. Okay? So once you start having that conversation and you start saying, okay, well, we've got aggregators who are putting neighborhoods together and, and then we're going to have storage, which is going to be another cost component, and then we're going to sell it back into the grid. Well, you better have a grid to sell it back into. Um, and that's really the, the point of this, which is somewhat being missed. The other point that's being missed, as with any demand response, is let's say cities are be better able in certain regions where there's a lot of sun to do this type of technology, just like wind is better in certain places. Well, you want to be able to move it around in the grid. You don't want it all just getting dumped in one place. And in fact, that's the California experience, right? That there are times when they're actually dumping power off of the grid because they can't use it all. Well, how wasteful is that, right? I mean, we're talking about being efficient and being uh, conservative in terms of uh, environmental reasons for generation. Well, you know, part of making this all work is having a grid that can deliver it and move it. And so I don't see it as an either or proposition. And I think that that's what our study shows. There are rules for all these different things. But one doesn't just say, oh, well, because a bunch of people put on solar panels, now we don't need a transmission grid anymore. Um, 
will it long term have an impact? I know in California there were a couple projects that were canceled because of um, projections around solar implementation. Um, and you know, my feeling is, well, we have projects that are canceled all the time because of changes. Um, a power plant gets built one place, and then we have to what we call reconfigure, which means we have to restudy all the power flows. Oh, I'm sorry, we have to restudy all the power flows to figure out, well, do we still need that facility? So that's not necessarily a change from how we currently do things. Will it maybe impact things long term? Maybe. But then we might actually have to build transmission for other reasons like ancillary services and other things that are identified in that little chart that some of those technologies don't provide. So I think it's just an important point to remember. We're not here to say that we oppose any one type of resource. What we are trying to say is we need to really look at the, the system as an integrated system because it is. The generation is tied directly through distribution in or directly into the grid. And what happens on one piece of the system impacts every other piece of the system. I try to tell people, don't think of it like pipelines. This isn't like an oil pipeline or a gas pipeline. It's like a spider web. Mm -hmm. And that really helps you better understand how a one little movement one place causes ripple effects everywhere else. Yeah. A well-balanced machine <laughs> that uh, is better than the individual parts when we sum it all together. So um, another common myth, if we can move on, um, relates to the cost side of any transmission investments. Um, if you pick up and, and do like an industry search of transmission investment projects that have been announced in the last 10 years, I will make a bet that 95% of the articles will have the name of the project and within two sentences it's costs. Costs and, and projects seem to go hand in hand because uh, generally these are large amounts of dollars being spent on big infrastructure projects. Um, but that, I think, uh, actually raises the problems we've seen around uh, the myth that I commonly hear, that transmission investment is just too costly. Um, the price tags are generally large because the infrastructure scale is large. Um, and that statement just, um, again, has a very negative connotation to many decision makers. Um, I think what they overlook the, um, is the fact that the cost, the price tag, actually is the driver for local economic benefits. Um, a billion dollar project typically is going to infuse anywhere from 500 million to 700 million worth of dollars back into the local economy where that project is being constructed and installed. So I think it's it's the use of the word cost that's quite deceiving because the next paragraph down and even the paragraph below that won't talk about the benefits. Um, and uh, one of the things that's commonly overlooked in the system planning world these days is that RTOs, ISOs go through extensive vetting of transmission investments. Um, uh, to ensure that the benefit to cost relationship is positive. In other words, that benefits exceed costs. Um, but I think um, those studies tend to be very technical and, and in some ways may be uh, far outside of the um, typical rubric that uh, is covered in the, in the press or, or um, in, in uh, the more basic descriptions of projects. So we need to discipline ourselves, I think, to make sure when we're looking at um, investments, we're not just thinking costs. We have costs and benefits side by side. Yes, please. Great point. In fact, um, this whole segment of category of myths has different um, subcategories, separate myths around it. So one of the myths is the, the fear of the billion dollar price tag, and I'm just using a billion dollars. There's many transmission projects that are much lower cost than a billion dollars. <laughs> but um, a billion dollar transmission project being too expensive, but rather the way that we actually allocate those costs is over so many years to so many different consumers that it's typically a drop in the bucket. Transmission still today is, the, um, is a much smaller portion of a typical customer's utility bill that they receive. And I wasn't talking about the cost, actually. I was talking about the, the, the expenses. That's what you're talking about, market efficiency. But if you're talking about a reliability project, you're talking about the same, the same reliability for 
many, many years. Yep. Yeah, and I, I think that, it, yeah, and I think also just to do one of our favorite stats, you know, transmission um, comprises somewhere between 7 to 10 percent of the overall cost to deliver power um, as a national average. In some places it's lower, in some places it's higher. So what you're looking at is if you increase that by one percentage point, you can leverage and reduce what is a much bigger portion of the cost of delivered power from the generation side or even the distribution side sometimes. And so, you know, it is one of those things where it's, it's fascinating to me that transmission has gotten so much scrutiny um, because of the cost, um, whereas, you know, and I can say this, I guess, because I'm not a generator technically. Um, but, you know, whereas, you know, on the generation side, we're kind of trusting that the markets are disciplining price and that we've got the best price we can get. Um, and maybe that's true and maybe it isn't. Um, but it does seem to me that, you know, there, uh, which we're going to go into a lot more depth on, so I don't want to take too long, but it does seem that one of the things to keep in mind is, you know, we do see in some of the generation prices, they're going down because fuel costs are going down. Wind doesn't cost anything, right? And so customers are seeing, you know, cheaper fuel. And so they're now seeing a reduction in their generation. Well, that's great. Um, but guess what? To get that wind, you got to move it and there's got to be some transmission. And so it's, it's a mixed bag, but I guess I would just remind everyone that, you know, when we talk about transmission, we're starting from the premise that it's already a very small part of what you're paying for in terms of getting your power. And then if you are able to leverage it to reduce the other portions, which are much more expensive, it's a great value proposition. And in fact, um, uh, again, kind of going back to what is already being done by system planners, um, we have a picture on this slide of the um, economic benefits that um, were evaluated for um, a particular, um, uh, well, it, it, it was part of the Midwest, uh, Mid MISOs, I'm, I'm going to get the acronym correct, MISOs uh, 2016. Um, uh, transmission expansion plan. And as you can see, there are a lot of different types of benefits um, uh, that essentially add up to the um, largest green bar on the screen. And that's then compared to the total costs, which is the second bar from the uh, right. Uh, and, and yields a net benefit metric. So um, what we need to do, um, I think in my opinion, to take it one step further, one step um, um, uh, beyond what system operators and transmission um, uh, decision makers, regulators are already looking at is to expand the categories of benefits and expand the time frame over which we're evaluating those benefits because it's not just the next 10 years, it's a much longer time frame. And I have to jump in one more time and just say, you know, and we're not the only ones who have looked at these types of calculations. The Southwest Power Pool did their own analysis of the investment they made under their so-called Highway Byway Plan, um, and they looked at $3.4 billion of transmission investment from 2012 to 2014. Um, that was a total of 348 projects. Um, and when they looked at a variety of benefits, um, they had benefits to customers that exceeded $16.6 .6 billion. Um, now, we could eliminate looking at some of those benefits, which is what a lot of regions do. Um, and even if you just did that, the benefits would be about $660,000 a day, $240 million a year. So calculate that over 40 years for the life of the project. Um, so it's, it's good to know that there are other entities out there who are doing the same thing. We are, SPP actually is one of the more robust regions in terms of looking at benefits. So one more example, if you guys hopefully aren't too, too bored talking <laughs> about myths. Um, I think another one that we have received, and this kind of segues really nicely to our discussions here, it, it's about the variety of benefits. Um, uh, one, of the, um, one of the things we're, we're seeing in our economy is that transmission invest investments, some of the big economic transmission investments projects tend to be um, uh, covering a, a very large footprint. Sometimes they're going across multiple state boundaries uh, because they are trying to capture um, the opportunity to gather electricity from um, uh, natural uh, producing areas where we have either cheap gas, like the shale gas plays, or where we have abundance of wind, or maybe even abundance of solar 
uh, PV production capability. They're trying to take that electricity and then move it to consumers. And our consumers are pretty distributed ar around the, um, the coastlines, if you will, um, and the urban centers. So there is a, a natural physical need for transmission that, that serves as the highway for electricity. But the argument then is, well, it's only the, those consumers on the coasts, those consumers that are receiving the power that are benefiting. And that's, um, again, a misimpression, I think, about the benefits of transmission. Um, transmission investment is not like a power cord. So that's another thing I learned from my 11-year-old. He thinks the transmission lines are like power cords. Um, we're not living in a world of power cords. Um, um, so, th um, and the reason um, that's a wrong analogy is because electric systems are much more integrated and our economies are much more integrated than what meets the eye. Um, so the benefits that we can think about accrue to people outside of the person at the end of the power cord that's receiving the power. And if we take this um, particular slide through its conclusion, there's the, what I call the source region, uh, where the power cords or the transmission investment, I should stop calling them power cords, <laughs> where the transmission investment really begins. Um, and there are benefits there uh, for uh, suppliers, uh, for generators, because they're going to be able to expand their market um, opportunities and sell into more markets, uh, make additional profits and revenues, expand their businesses, expand. Uh, um, we, we've seen many cases where generators were able to make investments and expand their um, power plants because transmission uh, allowed them to um, uh, we call it wheel or sell their power to other markets. Then we look at what I call transit regions, which is basically the um, areas that transmission, um, you'll see the transmission towers and the transmission lines, areas that are um, kind of in the middle between the source and the sink. Um, again, there's, a, I think, a, a, a misunderstanding about the potential for transmission to benefit those regions as well. Uh, transmission projects typically um, pay for use of land, uh, make property tax payments, um, and during construction, uh, the local economies um, in those ge geographies get the benefit of the boost because of construction that's happening uh, within their perimeter. Uh, we also have the sink finally location. That's where the consumers are getting access to lower cost, um, more uh, economic, more efficient, more environmentally friendly, hopefully electric power. Um, but there's also a, a, a number of additional benefits that we'll talk to as we go through the second paper that accrue to that geography or location of transmission investment. Yeah, I would just make a comment too. There are, there's been some press about a couple projects which um, are what we call direct current projects, merchant projects. They take power from one place to another and they do operate kind of like a power cord. And so there's been complaints from what we call the flyover states that they don't get any benefit. Those are not the norm. Those are not most of the projects that are built in the US. Um, there are more out west because there's a lot of terrain and reasons for that. Um, but what we're talking about are integrated projects at this point, You know, part of the AC network. And one of the comments I, I like to make to people when I talk to them is that, you know, you go in and you build a 345 or a high voltage line through a region, okay? What happens in that region? Even if you're not delivering power there, which I would argue you probably are in some ways because the electrons go where they want to go, but we'll talk about that later. So you're, you're going through that region in an AC network. Well, what happens is power flows up to the highest voltage you can reach because there's less resistance and you have fewer losses. So what happens is that frees up all this capacity at the lower voltages that now the local communities can take advantage of and in fact may divert other needed investment that they otherwise would have made. So it's not a zero sum game. It's not like, oh, a 345, I'm really getting it out of control. It's not like a 345 uh, line just basically ends up benefiting only people at the end because it has impacts on the system as a whole that are beneficial. So now that we've talked a little bit about the myths and how they're combinations of factual elements and maybe some false um, uh, uh, notions or misunderstandings, I think the big question that remains is how do we avoid the trap of going down the path of repeating those myths? 
um, around transmission investment. And in that uh, first paper, towards the back, if you make it your way through, you'll see that we've laid out what I consider to be six kind of rules, and that's why I called it a playbook. Um, um, kind of a, a, an ode to my husband who loves sports. Um, and I'm hoping that these six rules can help decision makers really think through a proper analysis where they can avoid being um, convinced uh, by myths that aren't um, wholly correct and think through the full realities of the power system. So first rule um, is that I think costs and benefits need to be evaluated together as a package. Um, second rule is uh, transmission alternatives need to be examined comprehensively. And the reason we think this is important is not simply because we want to um, prove out that transmission is better. I think it's really to prove out that this is an integrated system, that transmission is a complement to other types of investments. And in fact, uh, the need for other types of investments to some degree drives the need for transmission investment. So if we don't look at alternatives on a comprehensive basis, we're probably going to get an imp improperly planned system in the long run. The third rule is to recognize um, um, uh, the fact that uncertainty is not an obstacle to investment. Um, most people will think that they're very certain about the cost of something, but they're uncertain about the benefits in the future. Um, I would argue that costs are uncertain too, to some degree, but more importantly, the fact that we have uncertainty shouldn't stop us from doing the analysis. And there are tools out there, Nina mentioned scenario analysis, um, uh, among others, that can help us grapple with uncertainty and still make a, a robust decision on long-term investment. Uh, fourth point is to plan for the future. <laughs> and the future um, uh, uh, should probably come with a number of years, but I think at the minimum we need to be talking 20 years or longer out for transmission investment um, or any, frankly, large infrastructure project. Uh, we don't build these projects to meet the needs of tomorrow. It's the many years of tomorrow, many generations of consumers that we need to consider in the analysis. Um, I also think, and this uh, fifth point actually goes hand in hand with the fourth point. I do think, um, and this is a problem, I have this problem at home, you know, my kids were bad five minutes ago, I'm still mad at them. <laughs> I don't forget uh, or I don't remember as much all the good things they're go they've done weeks before and good things they're going to do in the future. I think we also have a natural tendency uh, to over rely on just very recent experience and have that color our understanding. Um, I recall meeting with many uh, local um, politicians and regulators in the Northeast after the math, aftermath of Hurricane Sandy and um, having everybody very concerned about investments. And then um, as the months went by and they turned into seasons and then years, I think many of the, I think, very thoughtful ideas and uh, initiatives sort of waned um, in their interest. And, and that's just one kind of colloquial example I personally had with, with it. But I think we need to look um, very objectively um, at all future conditions and not just worry about what just happened in the past. And finally, um, I think uh, it's very important to plan for the next unexpected. And this I think pairs well with uncertainty aspects because um, that's really the goal here is to build a transmission system that is flexible and resilient to changes in conditions uh, so that we're not caught off guard. And um, uh, the way I like to think about it, it, to be unprepared has a big cost or price tag for us too. So uh, when we think of investment planning, part of the purpose is to avoid those costs of not being prepared as much as it is to take advantage of the benefits of having that investment in place. Nina, comment? Um, no, I'm going to pass on that one, but I think we're supposed to take a break here, right? Yeah, I, I think this is a good point to uh, ask you all for, uh, for questions. We've uh, gone through the MISS study. I think what you clearly heard is that transmission is a, is a network, a spider web, not a uh, not a, uh, a a pipeline or an extension cord. Uh, it can be very flexible. It can deliver a lower cost energy. Um, it is inherently uh, very interstate in nature. Um, 
And I think most important, it, it's an enabler. That is, a, it, it's a, a, a new technology that we're all experiencing every day um, and that people frequently think of as alternatives to transmission are actually going to benefit from a more robust grid that can aggregate and dispatch those resources in a way that's very economic. So um, um, uh, th the benefits of transmission, because it's such a complicated machine, are not necessarily intuitive, let's put it that way. Um, uh, this is not easy stuff. Uh, you know, the lights are on, so what's the problem? Um, the, the fact is that we are in the midst of a transformational period that we need to prepare for, for, for the future. Um, and to the extent policymakers are able to digest the lessons that um, Julia has outlined here, uh, to that extent we're going to see um, uh, better infrastructure, more of it in the future, uh, that's going to enable all those uh, all those benefits. There are lots of big transmission projects that are dying on the vine uh, because people are kind of scratching their heads about uh, the, the price tag compared to the benefits, you know, next week or next year when they should be thinking quite differently about, about these big infrastructure projects. Um, I should say, for those of you especially who came in late, uh, these studies are available here, but we also have them on our website. Uh, and one study I, that we don't, we aren't really talking a whole lot about today is the one that Julie, Julia referenced. Uh, it's a study that was done in 2014 uh, that talks about new technology and transmission as an enabler, and that too is on our website. I think it's, I, I still think it's the best thing in the, in the whole uh, discussion about distributed generation versus transmission. Questions? Yes. Um, you all have talked some about uh, thinking 20 to 50, 50 years in the future. In the face of increasing, uh, increasing large storms and things like that, are you all focusing on resiliency of, of transmission? Great question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that um, we're having meetings this week, and that is one of our topics. I'm moderating a panel on resiliency. We're very interested in this issue. Obviously, FERC has been looking at it. Um, NERC, which is our regulator, our, our industry regulator, is looking at this issue. And what it really comes down to is how do you define re reliability? Um, you know, Puerto Rico, um, there's, a, there's some thought that, at least in Puerto Rico, one of the reasons why a lot of their stuff came down wasn't just because it was a horrible storm, because it was, but it was also because it wasn't well maintained. Um, and you know, in Florida, they've started building new facilities that can withstand category three hurricanes, as an example. And they got buy-in from their state regulators to do that, because otherwise, every time there's a hurricane one or two or three hurricane, you gotta go put everything back up again, right? Um, and so, you know, it costs more up front but over time it pays for itself. And so the resiliency issue is fascinating to us. We are beginning to look at it and try to figure out how to talk about transmission in that context because it's about a lot of different things. It's not just about hurricanes and storms. It's about security breaches and terrorist attacks. If we lose a couple big pieces of equipment, transformers, which by the way take at least a year to get replaced and they're from out of this country, um, what do we do? You know, how do, we, how do we deal with that? We have a spare transformer program in the industry, but there's also a transmission component to this. How could you reconfigure the system through transmission to get people up quicker and get power restored? Um, there's also just questions around the markets. And I was just gonna make, the, make a comment about this enabling issue, because it's not just when people think about, well, the lights are on, what's the problem? It's also better, are we doing this the most cost-effective way? And when you are not able to facilitate the markets and enable generation to move freely, people pay more. That's basically just supply and demand economics, right? And she's the economist here, I'm the colorful commentary. But I would say that you know we do need to look at that too. And so um, lots of states have different policy objectives. Some people want solar panels, some people wanna do wind exports, some people have a lot of natural gas, some people have coal. 
all of those are important to those states and they all want to be able to do different things with those resources. Well, guess what makes all that possible? It's all transmission. It's not just one or the other. We're not just building it for wind. Um, and so resiliency, though, I think is one of those things where people mean different things when they talk about it. There's been a lot of focus on the generation side of resiliency and what kind of fuel diversity we need in generation. Um, and Juarez is actually having a conversation about you know, maybe making a filing at FERC or talking about this in a more official way, but we don't want to get ahead of our members either. I will tell you that ITC has a lot to say, so we can talk later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, Julia, I'm going to go on to the next. Any other questions? Uh, we can go on to the next study. And, and I might touch upon the question of reliability benefits and how to measure them, and it will encompass resiliency as part of this, so hopefully we'll come back to it. Um, but uh, um, since we're in DC, therefore this graphic, um, <laughs> and we're moving on to the second paper. So I think much of the materials we're going to talk for the rest of our session is really covered in, in the second paper. And, and the purpose of the second paper was to move us down the road. So in the myths, we discovered that there's a lot of um, a consternation among decision makers and stakeholders in the industry about how do you go measuring uncertain benefits. And what we wanted to demonstrate in this paper is that it is possible to quantify future benefits of transmission comprehensively. And the best way to organize yourself in thinking about it is, is to make sure you're addressing all the important questions. And for us, these are the four important questions. Um, who gets the benefits of transmission? That's in the upper uh, left-hand corner. Um, uh, not surprisingly, transmission affects many different entities, um, although I think in, in, in some instances, system planners tend to only focus on one or the other. Transmission affects households, affects retail and commercial businesses, industrials. It affects generators. It affects small and large um, uh, industrial complexes, and it affects governments and how successful they are in implementing their policies. Um, what are those benefits? Well, very much linked to the beneficiaries, we have a diversity of benefits. We can affect consumers' uh, utility bills because we reduce the cost of producing electricity by allowing for more efficient trading of uh, electricity on the network. Transmission investment can increase reliability and flexibility of the grid. That basically avoids costly outcomes. It avoids uh, the fact that consumers don't have electricity and therefore can't do their business, can't um, um, uh, support economic activity. Um, there are also benefits from achieving policy goals, environmental policy goals. Uh, there's benefits to the local economy. It's well known that um, local economies benefit from an, kind of an economic boost during construction of large infrastructure. But there's also, and this is much uh, rarer in discussion, but there's also a lot of local economic benefits because consumers do see a reduced electricity cost after the project's put into service. Um, and that actually has a much more profound effect than even the temporary boost due to construction of projects. Um, where do we see transmission benefits? It's the geographical question, and I would just reemphasize what Nina said in that uh, because of the integrated nature of transmission, it's not just the point of interconnection or um, a 100 kilometer, 100 mile radius. Really, uh, what we're seeing in, in our analyses, because we can simulate how electrons will flow physically, is that um, the cost consequences of uh, major transmission benefits could cross state boundaries very easily, but travel thousands of miles. And newer transmission technologies are actually facilitating that because they're reducing the transmission losses that we've seen historically on older assets. Um, and then when do these benefits arise? Um, speaking to the question of timing, those benefits sometimes don't arise immediately. It takes time for transmission investment in some instances to really get to like their full maximum spectrum of benefits. Uh, for example, reliability benefits, and I'll show you some numbers, are, uh, can be uh, overwhelming in their magnitude in dollar terms, but you're not going to have uh, those benefits show up year after year. Those benefits from a consumer perspective might happen um, um, unexpectedly at some point. But what we do know is that they will happen 
oh, at least once over 40 years or longer. So it, it's not the question of when as much as knowing that um, we are likely to expect them at some point in time. Yeah, I just wanted to make one comment about outages. I know everyone thinks outages are storms or power outages, but we actually have what we call planned outages as well. All power plants have to be taken out of service at some point, usually at least once a year, if not more, for maintenance. That's a planned outage. Um, transmission lines need to be taken out of service so certain elements can be worked on, things can be fixed, poles can be swapped out. Um, and so the amount of excess capacity, for lack of a better word, or the amount of transmission and how robust your grid is influences how able you are to do that kind of planned outages and how long people have to wait for those to happen. And so those can be quite expensive and difficult to get if you have a system that's really running on the edge. Um, I will, um, before I get into the number crunching portion of this presentation, I did want to bring up an analogy and in the paper we talk, I think, a little bit in more detail about this. Um, in part, I think uh, people don't appreciate the electric wires because sometimes they're not even visible <laughs> uh, to, to, to some of us. Uh, but we all appreciate um, the roads. And we all have suffered through congested highways and congested local roads. I heard traffic wasn't very pretty this morning here in DC. Um, think of the transmission investments that we're talking about as um, additional roads, additional bridges, additional highways. Um, it's infrastructure with a big eye, but more importantly, I think it does the same thing that roads do, which is it basically gets people, goods, and services, uh, that's what roads do from one location to, the, uh, to another. Transmission basically does that with electrons, with electricity. It gets electricity from the point of production to the point where consumers are demanding it, where, where consumers are located. Um, and I think because of that, um, in, in economic terms, and I promise not to bombard you with a bunch of economic um, uh, theory here, um, transmission by definition is going to create benefits uh, because it's um, a, of the trade opportunities and the increased competition it provides to markets for electricity. Um, and I think that's important because sometimes when I approach um, um, uh, investors or uh, regulators about uh, transmission, um, the assumption is really zero benefits, and we have to convince them that they're there. Whereas I think if they think about the economics, they should recognize that there will be benefits. It's just a question of magnitude, but they won't be zero. Yeah, I would mention one thing about congestion, too, just so those of you who are from regions where there are organized markets, um, Every year, you'll see published information about how much customers paid for congestion in that region. That's because the way the wholesale markets work, there's a valuation put to congestion um, to send a price signal to, to encourage investment. We're not here to argue whether the market structure makes sense or not, but the point is we actually measure how much people are spending on congestion every year. And so, you know, right off the top, if you're doing a project that's going to eliminate congestion, you already know that not only are you going to eliminate that congestion for one year, you're going to do it for 40 years. Um, so that's why it's never zero in addition to being able to move things more efficiently to the market. There's also just the, the transmission congestion pricing component. Congestion costs can be enormous. And billions and billions of dollars annually. You don't see it on your bill, but believe me, it's there somewhere. Um, the, the, uh, I, wanna, I wanna clarify that by, by organized markets, what we're talking about is, is regional transmission organizations. It's uh, something created by, uh, by FERC, they're public utilities, and it means that for an entire region, uh, there is, is one uh, uh, organization in charge of administering uh, the power market, but also planning transmission and overseeing it uh, from one central uh, point. And uh, we are in PJM right now. The PJM interconnection, I believe, is still the world's largest uh, uh, organized. Uh, organized power market. Uh, sorry. Just Yep. And it's actually, PGM is one of the focuses um, of the second study. So uh, going back, our, our goal was to demonstrate to um, uh, readers that it is possible to quantify benefits. And we thought the best way to do that was to actually 
document in a report how you go about quantifying those benefits. And uh, in order to do that, we picked two transmission projects, uh, one on the West Coast, uh, Western Interconnect, and one on uh, the, um, in, in the, um, I would say, Midwest part of the country, but located in what we call the Eastern Interconnect part of the uh, national um, uh, uh, transmission system. Um, and we, we wanted to model projects that are um, hypothetical in nature because we didn't want to put any transmission developer on the hot seat. But at the same time, these are real projects. And we modeled them in, in the context of real, and I say real, th these are realistic projects. And we wanted to model them in the context of real world dynamics. So we simulated the power systems as they are today and as they are um, expected to be in the next 20 years and, and longer. Uh, so taking into account very detailed information that um, we have on location of project, uh, existing generation, location of new projects, future um, conditions for fuel, natural gas prices, um, uh, uh, various uh, state and regional policies related to carbon, renewable investment, and so forth. Um, these hypothetical projects, I think, represent very common drivers for transmission investment. Um, so for the MISO PJM transmission expansion project, we looked at what we call a trade enhancing project, where the transmission investment would lead to additional transactions between these two RTOs. Those are two organized, two separate organized markets. Um, and what we noticed as part of our modeling and we were able to quantify is that they also help these two RTOs achieve uh, decarbonization goals at a lower cost uh, because they're leveraging the ability to tap into spare generation capacity in one market or the other from time to time. The second uh, hypothetical project we studied was a simu uh, simulation of a, of a uh, transmission line that would start out in the Rocky Mountain area, tap into the abundance of wind uh, potential in that part of the U.S., and essentially uh, uh, deliver that power into Southern California where we have a lot of um, uh, interested electric consumers, but also policymakers that are looking to um, purchase uh, renewable-based um, energy. Um, the project has an interesting uh, dynamic. It shows um, how transmission could actually be an enabler to new generation investment because we're actually interconnecting in a part of the world that doesn't currently have working wind power plants, but would if there was transmission to take that power and deliver it to consumers. Um, so it, uh, I think, epitomizes that mutually beneficial relationship between transmission and other technologies on the power system. So what are the benefits? Uh, let me start off um, and, and um, take you through those. Um, I, w I do want to describe, and it's described, I think, um, in um, uh, exhaustive detail in the paper, the type of analysis we did, the type of models we used. But essentially, because we're talking about the future, these projects don't exist today, we have to look to the future, and we have to be able to model it. So we use uh, production cost-based network simulation models that really represent how the electricity systems work. And we also use uh, simulation models of the economies, the local economies. I'm going to use a really fancy term here, not to scare anybody, but essentially there's uh, what we call computable general equilibrium models of the economies that actually tell us what happens if one particular sector um, has a um, uh, a change in how it affects other sectors of the economy. So, for example, if we see lower electricity costs being paid by consumers uh, in a particular region, what does that mean to various businesses in that economy, to state-level GDPs, employment, labor markets? So it's essentially, a, um, I would say, an integrated approach where we first start with electricity markets, where the transmission has a direct impact. And then we look at the larger economy. And that's important, because we're getting um, that relationship between electricity, which is a, uh, certainly an input to almost every industry uh, out there, almost every product or service we consume as consumers requires some level of, uh, of electricity. So in the short term, um, we really are focused on the economic impacts of construction. Um, and. Um, 
uh, what we see uh, is that there will be um, essentially uh, an effect where transmission investment requires local spending to install the new transmission infrastructure construction activities and that construction effectivity a set of activities really starts to benefit through the larger economy construction workers are attracted to um, are employed by the transmission company to build infrastructure. They receive money, they earn money uh, working on the project, and that slowly ripples throughout the economy and affects other businesses individuals. Construction workers need to eat food, they need to uh, purchase uh, goods and services, they need uh, a place to um, stay overnight, they need an, a number of various services, they pay for those services. Um, they also, um, to the extent they're construction workers that have been relocated to the construction site, also send money home. And uh, so those um, payments affect even economies that aren't physically located next to the construction site. So moving on, what do we see in the medium term? I think of the medium term as when the project actually starts operating because it does take anywhere from, I would say, two years to maybe five years, depending on location, to develop and actually fully build construction projects. Um, five years may be a little bit too long, maybe four years. Um, and, and it depends on um, the location and complexity of the project. But once the project is complete um, and begins operating within the electric system, it creates um, immediate impacts on the electricity markets that Nina and uh, Jim have talked about. Uh, it allows for additional trading or transactions of electricity, and that reduces the cost of power, the cost of energy. And that basically ripples down to the bottom line for the utility bills that we all receive as ratepayers or consumers of electricity. Um, and it also boils down and also means additional profits for some generators um, um, as they're able to sell their uh, power to new markets. Um, it also um, creates benefits for policymakers because um, they can um, show that their policies to reduce emissions are successful. Um, and um, there's that added indirect effect on the local economies because frankly more money in our pockets um, even if it's five dollars a month is more money that we can spend on other goods and services other activities um, and that ripple effect um, it's well known um, very empirically robust and well established um, we rely on information from um, national data sources like the bureau of economic analysis and the uh, bureau of labor statistics um, they have um, uh, information that's useful in thinking through what a dollar of cost savings to consumers or to different industries means in terms of their ability then to expand production um, and uh, expand their economic activity to benefit GDP. So what about the longer term? Well, I think in the longer term, uh, and this is where scenario analysis is extremely valuable, what we see is that the presence of transmission um, creates uh, what I typically call reliability benefits, but I think through some lens that could be seen as resiliency, where the existence of transmission can um, help consumers and the markets avoid very costly outcomes where we don't have sufficient generation supply or the mother nature intercedes and creates problems uh, with our um, chain of electric supply. Those reliability benefits are uh, quite significant and um, we won't know when they will happen exactly, but I think we are pretty confident that they will happen given the long life of transmission investments at some point. And scenario analysis helps us establish that because we can look at what if cases. What if um, there's problems with generation facilities? Uh, um, uh, what if we start to see a lot of retirements of generation facilities as we're reaching their 40, 60 year life cycle? What if uh, governments pass laws that basically um, require 
um, changes in the generation mix and we can't keep up with the pace of demand. What if demand happens in areas that we didn't anticipate? All those essentially create what I consider to be supply shortages or problems that transmission by its existence solves. So maybe I can um, go through some numbers and I know we're going to be reaching our time limits. So I might just cover off one of our hypothetical projects and then um, I'm happy and available to answer any questions even outside this forum so as you uh, take a skim through the reports if there's other questions that arise please reach out to us but let me take you through um, uh, the MISO PGM trait enhancing transmission project it is an example um, this is a, a, a project hypothetically was one of the smaller scale transmission projects that could could be built. Um, it had a price tag, I believe, in our analysis of uh, approximately 200 million, uh, because it wasn't a very um, uh, uh, big project in terms of distance, in terms of the uh, of the area it covered. But it had a profound impact. Uh, so even that level of spending created a measurable impact on the local economy. So what we call the host state where the project was being built would see a boost in uh, GDP and a boost in the number of jobs created to construct the project over uh, a three-year period. Uh, and that's why that bar um, and the number of 22 million is colored in orange. We then move on to the medium term. That's when the project goes live and is, becomes part of the integrated transmission network. And at that point, we have lots of different categories of benefits. That's probably the best way to describe it. Um, we have uh, the electricity cost savings to consumers. We have increases in net revenues or profits to generators who are able to take advantage of the additional trading opportunities created by additional transmission. Um, we also see um, uh, uh, savings to the system from more efficient production. This is the fuel cost savings because we're not, um, uh, uh, we're able to avoid um, operating more expensive generation um, uh, on the system because the transmission creates a pathway to allow the system operator to uh, make more efficient choices uh, in terms of which generation to dispatch. Uh, we also see carbon emissions reductions. And finally, we see what I call local economic benefits. That's that multiplier effect because consumers are going to be paying less for electricity and they have more money in their pockets. They can spend that money on other goods and services and that really kicks off um, that um, uh, indirect and induced benefits um, uh, for other industries and expands uh, GDP. This, um, these numbers are all um, annual average numbers, so you could just imagine if you multiply it by the number of years um, and extend it out to over the lifetime of transmission projects, even from a project that costs 200 million, you can get to billions of dollars of benefits. Um, if we go out longer term, which is the last two columns, uh, we start to see also the value of reliability benefits. Um, as an example, um, if you look at the last two columns, uh, what we see is um, uh, savings for consumers from avoided supply shortages or even supply interruptions, basically having black blackouts. If we take the two bars from MISO, uh, that amounts to 740 million plus 480 million. Um, if we take the PJM numbers, that's 1.3 billion plus 550 million. We don't know when those savings can, will specifically happen, but I think we're confident to say from our scenario analysis that at some point over the life of the project they will happen. And, and um, those are important opportunities to help us think through the benefits. Because, again, this project had a price tag of 200 million. Um, the annual cost to consumers, uh, pr approximately 32 million. Um, so if we look at just um, the uh, electricity cost savings to consumers, that alone is multiples of the cost. In 
MISO, that's $110 million on average relative to an annualized cost of $32 million. In PJM, that's $400 million on average relative to an annualized levelized cost of $32 million. However, I think one of the issues we have, and this is probably where I might almost wrap up, um, is that it, it's sometimes difficult for um, uh, different organized markets um, to settle on these numbers because MISO may um, um, identify certain benefits for certain time frames but may not be willing to commit to paying for the entirety of the cost of the project. And PGM might do the same on, a, uh, on its end or may use a different subset of metrics. I don't think either PGM or MISO, frankly, any system planner right now or organized um, uh, markets um, uh, uh, RTO decision maker currently uses this full suite of benefits and by just focusing maybe on one category in one bar um, they have a um, uh, they won't get a full appreciation for the spectrum of benefits and may overlook or decide not to pursue investment opportunities because of the narrow um, uh, perspective. Uh, we have also a graph similar to this for the California project, but I think I'll skip over that. Um, the story is very similar, just the magnitude of the numbers are different because it was a, a project with a much larger cost um, and a different set of characteristics. Um, with that, um, I thought I would kind of end with a couple of key messages for us from this paper. Um, the first one being that it is possible to measure benefits of transmission, and those benefits are significant. And actually, probably that combines both one and two messages here. Um, the third message being that transmission investments will de deliver benefits to many different beneficiaries. And I think it's important for us to identify those, because if you don't identify all the be beneficiaries, you may overlook some of them, and that may lead to I think, suboptimal transmission investment decisions. And finally, the benefits of transmission investment are long-lasting and occur over a long time frame. So by focusing on a very short time frame, we will overlook projects that, um, if we build them today, would have delivered in the future very significant benefits um, to consumers and our local economies. Yeah, I guess I would just make a, a comment about different regions and how they look at benefits. It is a mixed bag, um, and I'm talking about regions that have regional transmission organizations, wholesale markets. I'm not talking about outside of those regions. Um, and, you know, for example, the Midwest ISO came up with what they called their multi-value projects, which really was looking at a multitude of benefits for all the, the projects they put together, and they did a portfolio of projects, and they were in the process of now completing the last one of those. Um, but generally speaking, what the Midwest ISO does is have project categories. So they have reliability projects where you basically build those because you're going to violate a reliability criteria standard under NERC rules. Um, and then they have economic projects, and economic projects, you have to meet a certain economic threshold to get them built. But you aren't allowed to commingle the benefits. So even though we know that reliability projects have economic benefits and economic projects have reliability benefits, if you're stuck in this sort of um, compartmentalization. And so very frequently, economic projects don't get built because we aren't looking at the broad spectrum of the benefits they provide. Um, so it's a, little, it's a little strange because the Midwest ISO did do it sort of the way we're talking about, but they don't do it like that all the time. Um, and SPP has a pretty broad set of benefits that they look at, which is which is good as is, is probably one of the better regions, really. Um, and then, you know, you've got New York and California, and I mean, there's just so many, every region has a different way they characterize their projects, a different way that they define them, and a different way they measure benefits. And so it shouldn't be a big surprise that certainly, um, Different regions have different levels of build out in terms of transmission. And then in addition, building between regions is highly complex and very, pretty much almost impossible to do because you're measuring different benefits and trying to say that the benefits are completely equal between two separate regions. And it almost never works out that way. All right. Well, um, 
let's uh, turn to you for some uh, some good questions. How about that? Yes. Well, I guess I would just say that that proposal is not new. It comes up time and time again in budgets because it is a large revenue raiser. And yet I see they've never been sold. Um, and so I guess politically, I think that's a pretty big mountain to climb. Um, those organizations give preference power, which is generally lower cost power produced by federal uh, dams and other types of low cost generation. And the people who have that power output and are guaranteed it don't want that to go away. So I don't want to be jaundiced and say it's all just a political calculation, but part of the reason it goes in there is because it does raise, raise money so you can offset other spending in the bill. Um, I don't think that ITC or Wires has a specific position on privatization of the power marketing administrations. I would just say that you know, we didn't even begin to talk about public power and the PMAs and how they fit into sort of the grid and how that all works, but that's a whole nother big complication, right? Because we have multiple different types of ownership structures and um, different agendas. Um, you know, if you're looking at a, a small public power entity, they just want to provide for their little city or their municipality, and they don't really have any interest in what anybody else gets or does, you know? Um, even though in this day and age, they're probably selling into the market or buying power out of the market, it's still a very narrow view. Um, and so when you look at something like BPA, Bonneville, or TVA, I mean, it's a much bigger organization, and, and it's, it's very challenging. But, you know, I would say that there's been talk about trying to promote transmission expansion along federal corridors, which I think is a constructive conversation to have um, to the extent that, you know, we can use some federal lands to get needed facilities built and not have to infringe on private property. I think that that probably makes some sense. Well, um, other questions? Um, well, I, I want to thank you all for being here today. And, and, and I think um, you might ask, well, why, why the focus on benefits? This is, we've, we've done multiple studies on this. And uh, frankly, if you, if you read them, you'll come away with the conclusion that transmission is a no-brainer. Uh, if, if you want your utility to be able to access lower cost power or lower emitting power, uh, or resources uh, that, that will help support rely, reliability um, uh, or bulk power markets that are more efficient. Uh, transmission is the key to all that. And, and um, uh, the problem is, and it's something that we, that we haven't really gotten into much today, is that a building uh, the kinds of projects that Julia was uh, alluding to that hypothetically uh, is a major undertaking. It's a 10 to 15 year uh, odyssey trying to get multiple approvals at federal and state agencies. Uh, and it is, um, it is uh, 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 relatively uh, tortuous, let's put it that way. You know, the, the Federal Power Act and, and regulation of utilities comes from an era when we thought of uh, a power generation distribution in terms of one utility's service territory. And then it was the state and maybe uh, the uh, interconnection of uh, one utility with another for emergency uh, service or, or, or economy power. Uh, and now we're thinking uh, that, the, that the power markets really operate regionally and, and, uh, and uh, interregionally, uh, potentially. Uh, because bigger is better. Bigger is more efficient. Bigger gives us more options. Bigger gives us the ability to adapt to that, that electric future that we keep talking about. Um, and and uh, so uh, can we get the benefits that we've talked about this morning under the current regulatory regime that we have? It's a big question. Uh, but I, I can tell you that, and, and I'm sure that uh, 
I'm sure that Nina would tell you this and, and her colleagues in, in the wires business, the transmission is not for sissies. You, you've got to be able to tie up a lot of capital for a long period of time and talk to regulators. I love regulators, but <laughs> you get to talk to them a lot over a long period of time about why this is in the public interest. And uh, that is, um, uh, that is a, 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 a reason to keep this dialogue going. So uh, you'll be hearing more from us, uh, I'm sure, in the future. Do you have any a benediction? Uh, I, have, I just have one closing comment, and I'll be quick because I know we're at time, which is um, generally speaking, the way that we do planning in the regions is very much incremental right now. People come in and they need transmission service, and we build to provide them transmission service based on their service request. They want to connect a power plant, we build to connect their power plant. We recognize a reliability problem because we do a load flow analysis or a power flow analysis, and we fix that. Um, we don't do very well big picture, hey, what's going on everywhere, and let's put that all together and optimize and come up with the best projects. MISO did do that with their MVPs, but we're having a hard time doing that again. And so what we end up having is what we like to call just-in-time transmission. You kind of, yeah, you're going to get interconnected. And in fact, there's a big argument right now about interconnection queues and how they're too big and nobody's able to interconnect. Well, part of the reason is because if you don't build big regional infrastructure, they have to pay for every little increment and every single one we build, then we have to restudy everyone behind them. But putting all that aside, the point is this, if one thing you can take away is not only about the benefits of transmission, it's about how we do planning and how we think about planning, because the benefits directly tie to that question. If you think the only benefit to transmission is the avoided cost of power production, you're not going to get out of an incremental cycle. But if you think about it in resilience terms or in terms of long-term benefits like we illustrated here, you're going to start thinking bigger picture and planning bigger picture. Now, we do plan a long planning horizon. I'm not saying that. But the data inputs that go into it, the assumptions that go into the models tend to be short-sighted. Well, thank you all. Uh, visit our website, www.wiresgroup.com. Uh, we are happy to take your questions anytime, and uh, uh, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you.